Welcome back everyone to Pontus Fathom Press. This is Pontus Fathom Podcast episode 22. We're talking about Mars and anthroposophy and specifically the Edgar Rice Burroughs Mars from his John Carter of Mars series and what Rudolf Steiner has to say in regards to not only Mars but also going to Mars. So we have like knowledge of higher worlds, right? So you can see like the... Uh, you know how I like to set these things up as a spectrum of, 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 of um, experiencing inquiry, right? So you have the, from the fantasy or author's point of view, which is a fiction, uh, it's just imagination, right? And then we go from there, we go to the spiritual realm of a, a philosopher, a religious thinker, a, a, a esoteric thinker. Right, which is also using a different kind of imagination. And then we keep going to the sort of more materialist view of, you know, observations of the planet, moving, you know, rockets to a planet, telescope looking into the planet. You know, just as we can believe a telescope can look at a planet and a rocket can go to a planet, in the world of spirituality, it's a different kind of seeing and a different kind of going, right? And then in imagination, it's pure fantasy, it's conjecture. And yet, if we lay that out as a kind of spectrum of human activities, right? And hey, we always call it world building. You know, let's just call it world building, integrating of myths, psychologizing, right? There's a number of things that you could call it. But let's get away from sort of bucketing it. Let's, I mean, let's get away from naming it and simply bucket it. We'll just put all of this into on the table. Everything's on the table here. And we'll just kind of walk through it. Quick shout out to uh, Pontus Fathom Press. Check out uh, our Necromancy of Nyarlathotep. Uh, it is Disclosure from Necronomicon Fragments. Help to support the channel. You can see a link to our Pontus Fathom Press bookstore below. Your support. Um, is also greatly appreciated in the form of comments, uh, liking and subscribings to get the algorithm to pick up on our video. I'd like to turn this into a live podcast, maybe after a thousand subscribers, uh, and really get that live feedback. But your comments are appreciated. Also, go check out the Patreon. There's some interesting stuff there that you guys can participate in, um, and we can have a chat there as well. So thanks for all of your support and for your uh, listening, m much appreciated. So let's jump right into it. Um, you know, if you start out with Burroughs, he's writing these books uh, around the 19 teens, right? So 1911, 1912, a 35 year old Edgar Rice Burroughs, kind of like an Arthur Conan Doyle building a fantasy world around John Carter, a Civil War um, uh, soldier who finds himself on Mars and there's a huge civilization there. And it's kind of like a very prototypical sci-fi that many sci-fi have copied from and lifted from. Um, you know, I think Star Wars surely full, pulls from it. And even to some degree, you could see um, how Dune pulls from it uh, in the sense of, you know, going to other worlds was, was a new business. You know, like we have H.G. Wells traveling to the moon. So all of this kind of, you know, Hugo Gernsback stuff. Um, and, and what's interesting is if we go back to scientific speculation before, or science fiction speculation before the age of space travel, we get a much different informed kind of way that is closer to Steiner's Anthroposophy. And these ideas would have been popular at the time. So the other thing I want to kind of call out is just uh, how we frame this. In one way to frame this, there's a, the spectrum of uh, human speculation, imagination, um, knowing, right? But then there's also this other way of framing this topic in the sense of uh, the confusion of names, all right? So if we could blur... I'm really interested in blurring those lines and seeing what, what we kind of find between the, the frames, so to speak. So with Burroughs, we get an early idea of going to Mars. But I, I want to share a quick story of this um, trip out to Arizona to the Lowell Observatory. Uh, and these are the Massachusetts Lowells, right? They were also out in Arizona. And that it's a great, fantastic 
um, you know, it's kind of got a cyber cyberpunk vibe to it. Just the, a, a telescope that was used uh, in early planetary astronomy out, out there in Flagstaff, I believe it is. And and one of the things that's interesting about uh, Percival Lowell was his drawings of Mars. So as you know, when you look at, at a planet, even with a great telescope on the Earth, um, the atmosphere somewhat obstructs our ability to see the planet clearly uh, from a pure telescope point of view. So what's interesting is, again, on this spectrum somewhere between fiction and science, Lowell would sketch what he saw, kind of like the early uh, natural scientists looking through te uh, mic microscopes and sketching out the cell and, and plant structures and things like this. Fantastic drawings. But then it seemed his drawings started to be informed by something other than his observation, right? So what was he, what could these structures be, right? And you see um, kind of like those, those um, rings of Saturn uh, books uh, that could be propulsion, right? You start seeing things in the clouds, so to speak. So in the blurred telescopic um, images, Lowell made out what he thought were civilizations. So, you know, we call them, maybe what Burroughs would call like the canals of Mars. We always call them the canals of Mars, right? And there are, in fact, depressions where water may have been. We're seeing this through real scientific evidence now. But uh, Lowell would extrapolate that there were maybe civilizations and some of this, maybe it's beyond observation. It's more in wishful thinking, imagination, speculation, uh, uh, extrapolation, Right. What do we? What, what could it be? And there's yet another in, in, insight to this, and that is, you know, what if he is onto something? Right. Something a little bit more uh, interesting. And 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 to put that con in context, just think of how all the religions have talked about Mars as a god of war, or have different names. Different religions have different names for these mythological names we give to the planets. And Steiner will do that as well. We'll look at Steiner's take on those. But even think of the current interest in Dune, uh, a desert planet, right? Dried riverbeds of Mars. There is a Mars energy of Dune, the, the planet of war, the Harkonnens versus the Atreides, right? Uh, uh, you can see the sands of Mars, the sands of Dune, the speculation of some kind of channeling sandworm, maybe. Uh, um, just introducing that, because if we think of it this way, D Dune being in the modern or in the recent um, zeitgeist is kind of a Martian energy, right? So there's sort of a Martian idea, a vibe to it. So what I'd like to do is kind of go into a Burroughs, and we're really going to focus today on the traveling to Mars aspect. And it's very, very strange how um, John Carter travels to Mars. Uh, first, we're going to a quick look into uh, Steiner's knowledge of other worlds. Oh no, let's start. You know, we'll go into Burroughs first. Let's go into Burroughs first. So we have at the beginning John Carter escaping. Here's a picture of John Carter, captain of Virginia, and he's escaping. This is a fantastic edition, uh, by the way, Fall River Press edition, very nicely done. Um, you have John Carter being pursued on horseback um, onto some ridge, and he finds a cave where he passes out. He's unconscious in it. And um, as he lays there, he's paralyzed in almost an undead state, right? So the idea is uh, from then until possibly, possibly midnight, all was silence, the silence of the dead. And then suddenly the awful moan of mourning broke on startled ears. And in the black shadows, the sound of something moving, a faint rustling of dead leaves. The shock to my over, already overstrained nervous system. So he's paralyzed in a cave and the night's passed. He tried to break his bonds, but with 
It was with an effort of the mind of the will of the nerves, not muscular, for I could not move, not even my little finger. And then something gave, and there was a momentary feeling of nausea, a sharp click as if the snapping of steel. And I stood on my back in the moonlight. But on the ground, he sees his body, right? So he's immobilized, dead. He has a Herculean effort, and he sees his body before him. But and yet he's also standing next to his body. Before me lay my own body, and, and he's standing over himself. So it's sort of kind of an out-of-body experience. My breath was short gasps. Uh, he could hear something from within the cave. And then uh, he left and ran out to the starlight of the clear Arizona night. The crisp, fresh mountain air outside the cave was an immediate tonic, and I felt like new. Pausing at the bridge of the brink of the ledge, I abraded myself what now seemed wholly unwarranted apprehension. Uh, he overlooks the aspects of the stars, and he stands there meditating uh, in the sort of light. As I stood thus meditating, I turned my gaze from the landscape to the heavens, where the myriad stars formed a gorgeous and fitting canopy of the wonder of the earthly scene. My attention was quickly riveted by a, riveted by a large red star close to the distant horizon. So he sees the planet Mars in the sky. And then he says, As I gazed, I felt a spell of overpowering fascination. It was Mars, the god of war. And for me, the fighting man, it had always held the power of irresistible enchantment as I gazed at it on that far gone night it seemed to call across the unthinkable void to lure me to it to draw me as a lodestone attracts a particle of iron my longing was beyond the power of opposition I closed my eyes stretched out my arms toward the god of my vocation and felt myself drawn with the suddenness of thought through the trackless immensity of space there was an instance of extreme cold and utter darkness. When I opened my eyes upon a strange, weird landscape, I knew that I was on Mars. I did not question my sanity or wakefulness. I was not asleep. No need for pinching here. My inner consciousness told me plainly that I was on Mars, as your consciousness tells you that you're upon the Earth. And that's it. That is it. Right? An out-of-body experience uh, and a calling like a magnet, right? The gravitational waves. There's a lot to unpack in there if we really got into it, right? There's a gravitational, there's a magneticism. The magnet, there's the red of the blood, right? The iron of the blood. There's so many things that are interestingly in this. And it very much so has the feel of like a uh, of one of the classic the the like you know a, um, the classic the like the Vril type of stuff um, uh, Litton's work you know some of the Blavatsky work so the idea here is there's not a rocket now we get to Mars there are airships and there's ninth Barsoomian rays and there's all these interesting theories but or cities and futuristic technologies with the different rays and, and anti-gravity and things like this. But the initial transportation is one of an astral, an astral projection. He leaves the body. Uh, he's suddenly at peace. He sees the canopy of stars. He lifts his hands to the sky. Mars pulls him. And when he opens his eyes, he's on Mars. And that's it. Just, you know. Um, and it's the way it's informed more by esoteric writing is very interesting. So let's kind of go into this knowledge of higher worlds by Steiner. He talks about enlightenment. Enlightenment is the result of a very simple process. Here, too, it is a matter of developing certain feelings and thoughts which slumber in every human being and must be wakened. Right? So he's paralyzed, he wakens. Only one with who with infinite patience carries through the simple processes strictly and with perseverance can be led to the perception of the manifestations of inner light. The beginning is made by studying different beings and things, 
a crystal, a stone, a plant, an animal. The thoughts indicated as examples must pass through the soul accompanied by alert feelings. The pupil says to himself, the stone has a form, the animal has a form. The stone remains motionless, the animal changes its place. The natural impulse which causes the animal to change its place is a desire. The natural impulses are served by the animal's form. If one thinks deeply into such thoughts while contemplating the stone and the animal, two quite different kinds of feelings will arise in the soul, one kind from the stone and one kind from the animal. And these are the organs of clairvoyance he talks about, right? But then he also talks about the idea of um, later stages of initiation in which um, those motions are no longer physical motions, but they're astral motions, right? So the idea of these astral motions are kind of like the way, the way uh, Burroughs is traveling to Mars. So again, we go back to the Lowell story. Lowell's a scientist, and yet he speculates on these cities of Mars. What was on Mars? What are the beings of Mars? Right? What is what is this Martian energy? You know, and if we keep looking into the theosophical, I mean the anthroposophical writings, you know, in occult science, um, Steiner talks about man and the evolution of the world right so the evolution of the world we're talking here about the sun and the moon and the earth but then he starts to talk ab along the lines of the other planets so um, he talks about christ coming to the earth he talks about an oracle of the sun he calls christ like a sun he talks about moon beings other oracles were called into life by the members of saturn mars and jupiter whose initiates carried their vision no farther. These are higher egos. And here he talks about the Mars wisdom, right? So the Mars wisdom, he says, besides the modes of initiation, there were still others. For human beings who had received into themselves too much of the Luciferic nature to permit a great part of the life body being separated from the physical body was the case of the sun humanity. More of the etheric body was held back in the physical by the astral body than with the sun humanity. Human beings of this type were not able, even in their most advanced state of consciousness, to reach through to the prophetic Christ revelation, their astral body being more under the influence of the Luciferic principle. For though there were beings who, though they had left the earth at the time of the separation from the sun, were not upon so high a level as to be able to partake in the sun's evolution. So they took to the evolution of the lower planets. So there arose the Venusian energy and the Mercury energy. And these further classes of the Mars energy call something called a Vulcan order. The human beings who revealed themselves with a higher ego are part of a Vulcan order. right? Uh, the Vulcan initiates could make, and Vulcan is, again is another kind of Martian force, right? Uh, Saturn, Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars initiates in the following way. They differed. The later received their secrets from a revelation from above, more in a finished state, while the former were already receiving knowledge of thoughts and ideas of their own. They had the ability to clothe their secrets in the form of human concepts. And then this goes into all this was given to the Atlantean humanity in this way, and it came to them through their initiates. Right? So here we have this interesting kind of return to Atlantis now. So there's advanced souls informed from potentially Martian as among the other and, and other outer planets. Um, and that knowledge was known to the Atlanteans. So now we have a, a much more wild kind of speculation. Right? You have Percival Lowell's explana explanation is life on Mars, right? cities on Mars. Burroughs' speculation, uh, you know, First, there's that fantastic astral travel to Mars, which resonates with, with Steiner. But obviously, when we get through the book, he meets uh, many races on, uh, you know, local, uh, like Tars Tarkas, the, um, the uh, four-armed um, creatures of Mars. He meets the uh, Dejah Thoris's, uh 
from the city of Helium, the princess of Helium, uh, runs into a number of different uh, Martian civilizations. And also, as the saga goes on and, and Burroughs writes about this, there's Jupiter, there's Venus, there's all these other life forms on these planets, which really kind of resonates a bit, a bit with influence of, uh, from this theosophical stuff. Now, just to kind of bring it home and wrap it up a bit, I mean, I, again, I think you guys kind of get the idea here of, you know, this, the early science fiction was much more um, aligned to spiritual thinking and esoteric thinking about astral travel and leaving the body. And now if we look at even current day, the, the direction things are going in, um, you know, a lot of activity doesn't take place in the real world, it takes place in a digital world, right? And, and you have to wonder some of the motivations behind this. Well, let's kind of find it, let's find out some of that from, again, from Steiner. Um, he talks in his uh, appendix of his Michael, right? Uh, Michael in the Michael impulse, you know, so Michael is the slayer of the devil, right? And he's a, the angel who's come. And it, and it, and it says that, uh, just quickly here, there's a a grail principle at work here, too. For example, when the scholastics had come down to the spiritual world for the work of Christianity in the Aristotelian form, he had not to begin with fully grasp the essential import of the grail principle. Uh, the appearance of the grail in the Wolfram van Eichenbach version of the story, the soul came down to earth somewhat later than the first. Uh, and this is perceived in the stories of the Arthurian Knights. So you have the Arthurian Knights and the Michael energy. And then he wraps up this book with talking about um, the ages of the angels. And it's very interesting. So he takes us through each angel and the planet they correspond to. So we'll kind of go through this quickly. This is from uh, an appendix where he outlines the Johannes Trithemius's book on the mystical chronology and the planets. So you have the age of Gabriel, which is the moon, and then you have the age of Michael, the sun, and then Orphiel, the angel of Saturn, and then Aniel, the angel of Venus. So you have, this is, um, uh, you know, goes back to BC times, and then we are, again, we're Tower of Babel times, and then we're talking about Zoroastrian times, and there's the angel of Jupiter in the patriarchs times and then we keep going until Raphael is the spirit of Mercury and that takes us up to uh, Moses and then we have this is the interesting part in the 12th epoch Samael the angel of Mars Samael like Samhain like right Samael becomes the world's ruler for the second time it was on October 2nd of the year of the world 3,897, right? And Samael ruled 354 years. Under his reign, the great celebration destruction of Troy occurred. So now we're in the Trojan War. And also cities were founded like Paris, Carthage, Naples, Corinth, Jerusalem, Lacedaemonia, right? This is the time of kings unfolding and dynastic changes, the Venetians. And this age lasts until, I believe, the 1500s. Under the dominion of the same planet Mars, Saul I came after King David in the Temple of Solomon. Right? And then the Medes, Rome was built. And this takes us up to uh, the Roman times, Pompeius and Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, yeah, so very interesting, right? So we start to see that these ages uh, continue. And now Samael comes back again. This is his third governance. He took up for the third time the governance of the world, and he ruled for 354 until the year of the Lord, 1525. Under here, under, so again, another Martian rulership. So as we cycle through the, the um, as we cycle through the angels' um, rulerships, we return back to Mars again. 
And this ended in the princes of Italy. Again, the princes of Italy has a great resonance again with Dune because these are princely houses in the far future that are warring kind of like Italian um, feudal houses were warring uh, in that period. You know, like think of the the idea of, the, you know, the prince, Milan and these things, right? Um, and then also the age of Juice, Jerusalem taken taken uh, was just uh, was uh, taken by the Muslims and then they have in the 40th year of Samuel the Saracens fought the Christians uh, the Bedouins the Flanders um, a number of in 1244 in 1238 there was an eclipse and continuous earthquakes Phrygia was almost completely submerged in 1244 Toledo, a book was found written that Christ would be born of a virgin in the third world and would suffer for the salvation of humanity. Interesting. The third world could be the third period of Saturn. Uh, and then finally he goes into the um, Europeans, the Rudolf of Hamburg, Emperor Frederick, etc., etc., so yeah, interesting, interesting uh, wormhole. You can get lost down in this. But again, just to call it out, the age of Mars, the first period of Mars, also announced the flood. Right? During the first period of Samael, Mars announced the flood. During the second, the fall of Troy. Toward the end of the third, there's a break in unity. And indeed, based upon the precedence, one might infer the following. The third period of Mars will not conclude without this prophecy being fulfilled and a new religion being instituted. Right. So he's talking about the next coming period of Mars is quite, quite interesting. Right. So, yeah. So that's about all I've got for today. Uh, Burroughs imagination. Obviously, it's a it's a great precursor to science fiction, uh, but also the idea of um, that creativity uh, finding at its source not only the imagination, but some of that spirituality and spiritualism that was going on in the same time. I mean, um, Steiner was writing the same, maybe a little earlier than Burroughs. And not sure that he had read this, but you can see that this was on people's minds. And people were quite um, interested not with the technological um, happenings, not using technology to get us forward, but more on the spirit intuiting of going forward, right? So it's, it's I think Trithemius uh, wrote in the year, he wrote in the 1500s, right? He was writing in the 1500s, again, just in the uh, pre, surely pre-enlightenment um, times and more like scholastics and in the, in the kind of alchemical times as well, the tail ends of the alchemical times. So that's all I've got for today. Um, hope it was interesting. Um, uh, we'll be doing some more of these. Uh, last week we did the bleach and the theosophy quick, quick takes. Um, let's know in, let us know in the comments. If you have some topics you'd like us to explore, have any ideas, uh, similar content that you guys are creating. We'd love to hear your ideas down below. Uh, check out the links below and thank you for your time. Uh, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.